Jan Wojciech Kubań. Jan Wojciech Kubań is an entrepreneur. You might remember it from yesterday. He was here at the panel. He is running his own private company since 1989, QBS Software. But he is also uh, president of the Pafere Foundation. And Pafere means Polish American Foundation for Economic Research and Education. He is a freedom lover, libertarian, but also a very practical person. He tries to implement ideas, not only talk about them. And uh, his speech will touch the question of implementations and realism in freedom fighting very much. So, welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. A uh, couple years ago, I went back to my home and I set the television and I switched to the Russian channel. And the speaker said that uh, Mr. Putin will welcome Russian entrepreneurs because he is very eager to make economy, the Russian economy, the biggest, the strongest one in the world. So he wanted to listen to the uh, Russian entrepreneurs. And I started to saw it, to watch it, and they were really the group of Russian entrepreneurs, and they started to speak to Mr. Putin. The taxes are too high. We have no liberty. There is two more regulations. And Mr. Putin said, yes, I will help you, but listen, the tax must be high because we have to help poor people. We have to regulate because there is a lot of bastards among you. So first, I started to think that maybe the Russia will, will get this stage of the, one of the best economies in the world, but later, I, I realized that uh, he is using the same methods uh, as the politicians use everywhere. So I would like to generalize in some extent and give us, give us uh, a tool just explaining to young people what the power is about. So the title of my presentation is Power versus Freedom and solution, because as Jacek said, I am a very pragmatic person and I would like to implement some solutions. So there is a solution, and this solution is completely different than uh, this, the solution proposed by Professor Reed yesterday. Uh, okay, everybody of you knows that there is strong correlation between freedom uh, of economic and the uh, economical results. So here is the um, ranking list of, econom of Index of Economic Freedom of 2018. We see Hong Kong, Singapore, New Zealand, Switzerland, Australia, Ireland, and so on and so on. Uh, here is in more details, uh, second, 10. And Poland is in the 45, 45th place. The higher the economic freedom, the higher the economic freedom, the richer the population. So it's obvious. It's we know everybody knows about this. Uh, what is the method they calculate this index of economic freedom? They have four factors, and each of them have three sub-factors, and they add the results, and they get the the index of economic freedom. So the first. Uh, uh, factor is a rule of law. They regard property rights, <clears throat> they investigate government integrity, so adherence to moral and ethical principles, honesty of, of uh, governments, uh, they investigate judicial effectiveness. They investigate government size, government spending, tax burden, fiscal health, widening deficits, a growing debt burden, and inflation. And uh, third and fourth factor are related to freedom. So business freedom, labor freedom, monetary freedom, trade freedom, investment freedom, and financial freedom. So as I said, they investigate, they give some values to uh, each of these factors, they add it, and they get the index of economical freedom. So, if we know that freedom is strictly correlated with uh, uh, economic effectiveness, 
Why does it happen that uh, all the economies are not free? Because of these people. Power is the ultimate, ultimate resource. If one has money, he has power. A lot of people are thinking like this, but it's not true. If you have money and you don't have power, you can very fast lose your money. But the truth is, if one has power, he does not even need money. He has everything. So it started from him, and you know, this is some, one of our best kings. Uh, he has power, he has money, and so on. So, uh, looking at the way the, the people in power are managing their own countrysides and own homelands, I came to the conclusion that all of them are using quite the same methods. So, I defined the typical instruments of governance, a list of instruments used throughout history by those in power to ensure that they maintain and increase their control. So, the first is constantly striving to gather more and more power. Do you see here in brackets there is... Can you read this? Yes. Okay, so I would like to ask you to help me, because the audience is very young, so we will repeat this, okay? I will ask you to repeat. Oh yes, brother, they want more and more power. Okay. okay. Oh yes, brother. Okay, great. So I think in the next will it will work better. So they gather the resources necessary to exercise power. Okay, how do how do they do this? They tax people. They inflate. So they increase the amount of the amount of money by and decrease the value of the money, and they grow the public debt. Oh yes, oh, yes. brother. Yes. They form the social groups supporting the rulers, so-called state beneficiaries, security, security forces, employees of state offices, state scientists, state teachers, etc., etc. I remember when I was about 17 years old and later 20 years old in Poland, everybody worked for the state. Everyone, everybody was very well paid. So it, it seems it was the, the best situation ever. But we have nothing to eat. <laughs> oh yes, brother. <laughs> they are supporters. Uh, they do not use the systemic solution. They bias the distribution of privileges they uh, favor through finance. So there is subsidies and uh, you are the bad, bad entrepreneur, you will not get our support. If you are a good entrepreneur, you will get some money from us. Oh yes, brother! Systemic solution, it means, it means the free market. It's a solution, it's a system which, which works by itself. It makes the very, very rapidly the all necessary correct, corrections. Uh, they will to regulate everything by law and procedures. So there is excessive legislation, uh, they impose illogical and mutually contradictory rules, even, even in Switzerland. I am not mentioning Poland because it's obvious, you know. And our, our uh, dep uh, European deputy, uh, one month ago, he did, uh, once months ago, he discovered that the European Parliament passed the law, and two weeks later, they passed the new law, completely contradictory to this one they passed two, uh, two weeks before. So it's true in, in every level. Uh, and they in the interpret the regulations in a diff very different manner. Oh yes, brother! Yeah. Okay, we have a little bit more. So, they apply different standards for their own proclivities and those of others. It's a typical situation in Poland if you run a private medical uh, facility, you have to uh, follow 
the, a lot of regulations, a lot of regulations. If the hospital is public, okay, you don't need this, you don't need this, okay, just maintain it, okay? You, you are not obliged to follow this regulation, this one and this one. It's obvious. So, you know, uh, this is, uh, so there is lack of transparency of their own actions yet with an ever increasing scrutinization of others. It's a typical process nowadays in Poland. Uh, they run their own businesses with different regulations than the rest of the population. They transfer responsibility from the rulers to the ruled. Oh yes, brother! Great! They make justice complex, costly and difficult to access. Oh yes, brother! They make people dependent on the state by educational system, scientific research system, gratification of pro-government attitudes using carrot and stick methods, and increased benefits for state workers. So I am operating in a um, uh, programming market, so I'm looking uh, for, for the programmers. A lot of programmers nowadays in Poland, either they emigrate or they go to the state uh, enterprises because they are better paid and they have n not so many to do. Okay, so... Uh, oh yes, brother! Uh, when I lived in the communism, there were a lot of a lot of information in the in the television set that we are uh, we, in the nearest future we will be the richest country in the world, that we, our economy will be the best, and so on and so on. And they talk, they talk, and we saw that the, our living standards is go, living standard is going down and down. So. The people in power, power use aggressive propaganda instead of explaining and teaching social mechanisms. See at you, look at you. So we are the group of the, of the people who are trying to investigate how the society works. We are not present in the, in the mainstream media. We are just clandestine organization, you know. We, we, we work and we cooperate underground. We are not publicly known. I went to the radio, Krakow radio, and I am saying, listen, there is a congress, international congress, there is people from all over the world, Japan, France, um, uh, okay, everything I, I quite forget. I said, yes, uh, what, what about this congress? Congress. I said, you know, how to manage the country better, how to, to be uh, welfare societies, and so on. Oh, it's interesting. They said nothing, no one. They were anyone from that. They are not interested in it. Oh yes, brother, they lie. The people, uh, the manager, so the manager of, uh, of people uh, in power, they are, uh, they, they are convicted that they can solve any kind of problem by using two methods. One of it is any problem can be solved by greasing someone's palm, someone's palm and to solve any problem, you need the appropriate procedures and the team of state officials in your pocket. So it's enough to have, you know, uh, ten officials, some money, and we will build everything. We will fly to the space and so on. Oh yes, brother. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh yes, brother. Stereotypes. Uh, very important factor, which is uh, which I can see now nowadays in Poland, is that the uh, people in power do not see the social cost of decision made. They introduced so-called RODO. It's a regulation, European regulation, devoted to uh, protect your identity. It's uh, you know there is the rules completely contradictory. And if you want to follow all, a few of them, you will spend your time and all of your money, and so you have to close your, your enterprise. Uh, oh yes, brother. They restrict freedom. They, there is aversion to independent non-governmental organizations, 
and aversion to independent entrepreneurs and thinkers. So independent entrepreneur is always shown as a guy who steals, who exploits, and so on. So it was during the communism, and now this is coming back. So we regulate because these bastards will exploit you. So you will be protected by our regulations. So this is a re their narrative. Oh yes, brother, yes. freedom. They create their own monopolies, internal national security, judicial system, educational system. They make economy and trade dependent on the system through arbitrarily imposed regulations, privileges, tax relief, and looking the other way. Oh yes, brother. Yeah, it was a good accent. Monopoly. Yeah, I cannot say like this. Monopolis, no. Monopolis, yes, monopolis. Thank you very much. So, they were, how many of them? They were 13. But in one sentence, it's a quotation from Bill Frieza's book uh, about New Zealand. If private businesses kept their book, books in the way most governments keep their book, our jails would be full of CEOs. I like this quotation very much, but it fits very well to the main thesis of my presentation. Uh, okay, so what to do? We are gathering here, we are talking, we have a lot of problems in all of our, uh, the, the majority of all our countries. And as you know, I have worked in Switzerland. Do you know the, the name of the Swiss president? Who cares? Who cares? <laughs> and do you know why you don't know who the Swiss president is? He has no power. He has no power. Okay, because of this, okay? So the solution already exists. I think that the solution is a principle of subsidiarity. Do you know what does it mean? No. Okay, so my presentation will serve for something. <laughs> Uh, and by the way, I met a Swiss guy, he's um, uh, not ambassador, by, but uh, some very important in the Swiss embassy, and I asked him, you know, can you explain me the phenomenon of the Swiss political system in just few words? And said, okay, it's, it's very easy. Uh, the bourgeois from Switzerland, uh, is from Zurich, and the peasant from Grison, and the watchmaker from Geneva, they, all of them, they live in a very different cultural and, and different worlds. And they do not even understand each other because they speak different languages. <laughs> but they agree 100% in federalism based on subsidiarity. So, if we don't, don't know what, that, what subsidiarity means, let's investigate the problem. Uh, here is... 1931, and Pope Pius XI uh, published his uh, encyclic, Ency you name this encyclic, yes, Quadrissimo Anno. And this quotation is an uh, answer for the socialists. The socialists want to regulate everything. They want that the Mr. the chairman Stalin or chairman Lenin will know everything, as chairman uh, Castro. They know everything, they will know how to uh, run the country. Okay, so the Pope should say something. And he's saying, so this is a very difficult quotation because the Pope is not able, so Pope is not allowed to speak in a very uh, easy language. We will translate it uh, into, uh, later in, into English, but let's read it. I will try to do this, maybe you will understand. If not, just say me, I will ask some help from American side. Just as it is gravely wrong to take from individuals what they can accomplish by their own initiative and industry and give it to the community, so also it is an injustice at the same time a grave evil, grave evil and disturbance of right order to assign to a greater and higher association what lesser and subordinate organization can do. For every social activity ought of its very nature to furnish help to the members of the body social and never destroy and absorb them. 
So you have something you have some problem of understanding of this? No. I think yes, a little bit. Okay, you can study it later after the after the congress. But look at this. The word German word subsidiarität. Sub, how there is German German speaking people? Subsidiarität. Subsidiarität. Okay. <laughs> and you remember the principle principle of subsidiarity. So it's something like this. Uh, what is subsidiarity? How how have we uh, how have we uh, understand this this uh, this concept? So uh, everything starts with the Romans. They develop, as you know, their military art, and they have subsidium. What does it mean subsidium? So there is military force fighting against another military force. But we have some troops nearby which are not fighting because we use them if we fail to win the battle and we have some problem in some of the place in this battle. So we use these troops only when necessary in the, as a last resort. We don't help always, but only as a last resort. So, John Paul II, uh, in 1991, he uh, refers also to this uh, principle uh, in, let's say, it's more com comprehensible, so let's read it, by intervening directly and depriving society of its responsibility, the social assistance state leads to a loss of human energies and an inordinate increase of public agencies which are dominated more by bureaucratic way of thinking that, than by concern for serving their clients, and which are, uh, which are accompanied by enormous increase in spending. In fact, it would appear that needs are best understood and satisfied by people who are closest to them and who act as neighbors to those in need. So it's more understandable, okay? John Paul II was born in communist Poland, so he observed how socialism works. And it's sure, he read the Pius XI encyclic and he wanted just to um, make it more understandable and add something. So, the principle of subsidiarity, in just few words, it's uh, power should be centralized only as much as necessary and decentralized as much as possible. Is it utopian? No. 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 It works. Who decides? <coughs> Where it works? Who knows? Switzerland. In Switzerland. Thomas. <laughs> Uh, principles, principles of socialism versus principles of subsidiarity. So this, uh, it's a pigeon, yes? It's a pigeon asking what, uh, what are the other words for subsidiarity? Inferiority, decentralization, lowliness, humbleness, subordination. And if you look at the political system of Switzerland, you will see that this system is based on three pillars. Federalism, based on subsidiarity principle, citizens veto referendum, and citizen in, citizens initiative referendum. Uh, if we have time, we can enter deeply in, in uh, details of, of uh, Swiss political system, but now I would like just to say that they have, the citizens, all the people in Switzerland, they have possibility, they have such a political instrument to abolish the law which is passed by the elected politician, which is not the case in Poland, which is not the case in the majority of countries. Here in Poland, we can just vote only one for four years and elect our uh, representatives. Because uh, tele mainstream media I control, are, are controlled by the par political parties, so we are not electing the best people but we are electing the people, the, the best presented in the mainstream media. 
And as we can see, we elected the people who performed these 13, uh, 13 ways of governance, typical, typical way of governing people. Uh, I am very uh, for poli Swiss political system, so we as a uh, uh, Foundation, we have published a book entitled, Do you know why you don't know who the president of Switzerland is? <laughs> this book is a miracle book because it is written in English. If you turn it like this, it is written in Polish. <laughs> Okay, it's uh, the people who are reading this book. You see, it's not not uh, very thick. You can you can read it. I think in a, in a half a half an hour. Uh, it's a short introduction to the political system of Switzerland. And so I promote this system in Poland. And because of this conference, I have an opportunity to meet Swiss guys, and I send them the book thinking that they will say, yes, it's excellent, our system is really the best in the world. <laughs> but I got these emails. Thomas, can you read? <laughs> I guess you guys can read. Uh, I see my country from a much more clear, critical angle. To me, the book was like reading a well-meaning travel guide about my own city. It may be all true and inspiring at the same time when I live in that city. I have my own perspective and quarrels from the challenges of daily life in it especially as a libertarian. Therefore, I also agree with Henrik that I would likely spoil the spirit and message if I would comment on parts of the book on its first presentation, and that would be a shame. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, I think that the people who are deeply involved in, in different systems, they look very critically toward this system. Who is watching your system better than you? Someone from extent. So a couple of years ago, I, every day I'm going to the gym, and suddenly a couple appeared. This couple was not very pale as I am or my wife. They were looking like Bulgarians, or, or I saw they, they, they may be Romanian or, or Bulgarians. It happened to be a military attaché of Brazil to Poland. I don't know, you know, what kind of military relations we can have with, with Brazil. <laughs> Probably we will attack uh, Honduras or... Uh, you know. But okay, he was a military attaché. And he said, Poland, it's a beautiful country. I said, yes, it's nice. You know, your system, political, political system, it's a very good. Oh, <laughs> Polish political system. You are so patriotic, and in Brazil nobody care about, uh, about their homeland, and you are so patriotic. Okay, a couple of days ago, this attaché went to visit Brussels and Copenhagen. He went back and he said, I will ask for a, for a political asylum in Poland. I said, why? It's a very peaceful country, you know, there is no police on the streets, there is no army on, uh, in the streets. You, uh, if you travel around the Krakow, have you ever seen a policeman here? No. So go to Brussels. Go to Brussels, okay? And you will see all the troops, military troops with the gun, with their guns. Okay. So I think, Thomas, that uh, if we, we compare my problem and your problem, so now you have the problem, you want to introduce some uh, golden coin or something like golden coin initiative. You, you, you talk about money and, and gold and so on. And my huge problem in Poland is that they are making the regulations that, that free entrepreneurship will not be possible. Okay, so this is essential. Now it's up to you to judge which Whose problem is more more uh, important, yours or uh, yours or mine? Okay. Well, I'm not going to apply for a citizenship in Poland. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think that the solution of subsidiarity and these three pillars I mentioned here, federalism based on subsidiarity principle, citizens' veto referendum, and citizen initiative referendum. So what does it mean, citizens' veto referendum? Uh, the Swiss are saying, no, this law is bad, okay? We run the referendum, they run the referendum, and this uh, referendum is mandatory. So it's obligation, the state should say, okay, this law is not uh, longer valid. 
citizens' initiative, you can have some uh, idea and you may introduce this idea as an ordinary citizen. Uh, Thomas can prove it because he's an ordinary Swiss who is running his own uh, initiative, citizens' initiative uh, referendum. Okay, maybe he will fail, maybe his initiative is just, you know, crazy idea, maybe it's a good one. Who will decide? Not the president, but all the Swiss people. Uh, at the end of my presentation, I would like to uh, show you the book because the core messages of, of the book pre presented in this book are unlisted uh, at the very beginning. For me, the most important core, messages from, uh, core message from this list is number 10. Each canton has its own constitution, own parliament, all, own government and own courts. And I hope and I dream to have the same in Poland. Thank you very much. Yes, hi John. It was just a wonderful presentation. I loved it. The Constitution 19, in 1848, Swiss Constitution, and the Swiss Constitution in 2000 are both basically revisions of the American constitutional model, except with some improvements. And one of the great things is the Citizens Initiative. And subsidiarity is really fundamentally built into the United States constitutional structure, where the most power in the Ninth and Tenth Amendments reminds people of this. The most power is always at the bottom. You always try to do things first at the city level, and if you can't solve the problem at the city level, then, unfortunately, you climb to the county level, and then if you can't find a solution there, you go to the, the, the state level, and then finally, you climb up to the federal level. That was great before the Civil War. When we went from the United States of America to the United States of America, and they just didn't, they had so many pieces of stationery and business cards with the S still printed on it, they left the S on it, it was too expensive to get rid of it. But the Swiss, the Swiss figured it out, and, and you're right, they solved the problem from power, most powers at the bottom, and the least powers at the top, and that's why Switzerland doesn't go into treaties except it got involved with the bloody United Nations, that was only about 20 Yeah, years. But, but if you talk to the Swiss people, they, ac they agree completely with the point one. The politicians want more and more power, even in Switzerland. They want to socialize this country as well. So this this is a you know natural drive of, of these bastards. And uh, I think so. I, I I am not investigating very deeply. I am not you know I have no time for the for the time being to investigate deeply the political system of uh, of Switzerland. But I think that their system works systemically. So the people for the time being they maintain this subsidiarity. Okay, they manage to maintain it. Yeah. But uh, if the people are not, uh, don't have the character, as Lauren said yesterday, it will on the long run not function because the people have to vote. You understand? Yes. So if they vote the wrong thing, you get the same thing like in Poland, and socialism and more power to the government. So the biggest, the biggest problem, so we mentioned in this book, there is a paragraph I advise to read first. It's a paragraph number 3.2. Swiss mentality, okay? About you, about you Swiss guys. Uh, it's not a process, you are not, you know, uh, it was a long process that you behave in such a manner. And I would like to investigate the factors which produced you during the subsequent generations that you became such a people, responsible, uh, okay, and uh, you know, precise and so on and so on. So this is ne uh, not the case of Poles, but I am seeing some processes. When the Poles are involved in maintaining their building, they live in, they start to think very practically, they uh, control the finances, and they are very smart as far as management is concerned. So my hypothesis, hypothesis is that the Swiss became so wise, as it, as it is written in the paragraph 3.2, because of, uh, let's say, maybe three or five generations, because you work on the free market. So you consider everybody you meet as a potential customer or as a potential 
uh, employer. Okay, so you have good relations with the people. In the socialist uh, uh, pyramid, when the um, uh, chairman Stalin is on the top, the people don't care about uh, human relations. They care only who is superior, who can kick me, this one, and this one I can kick by myself. Okay, so this is what was like this. So I think this mentality is not because you are Swiss. This mentality is because you are uh, the object uh, influenced by some procedures, some, some factors. And these factors produced such a people as you are now. But beware, you, the subsequent generation of Swiss may be worse, okay? You, you may, you may uh, lose all, your, all these values you have nowadays. I really like the idea of referendum, but I think the biggest problem in Poland is that people don't want to attend them. Uh, it's usually around 10% of attendance. Uh, okay, I, have, so I wanted to ask two questions. First one, what do you think, why people don't want to vote in referendum in Poland? And the second one, what we can do to change it? Okay, so this is... Uh... I will ask for these questions uh, a little bit later. I uh, will talk about subsidiarity, because you mentioned that subsidiarity is mentioned in the Constitution of the United States. It is even mentioned in the Constitution of the European Union. But, but, these bastards changed the meaning of this concept. If you check it in uh, Wikipedia, for example, what does it mean, subsidiarity? It's a principle of help. They are not mentioning that it's a, as a last resort, just as a help. So they transform the meaning from this its basic meaning mentioned by two popes into the meaning of meaning of socialism. They change it. Okay. So this is uh, the first in, in, in introduction to, to to your questions. Uh, okay, Swiss have uh, referendum, and in Poland we have the referendum as well. But we in Poland uh, have the proverb that the devil always is in the details. So, the referendum in Switzerland is very, very simple. If you have 100,000 signatures, state is obliged to run the referendum. And now? State is obliged to run the referendum. Yes, Jacek, ask Thomas, is obliged. And the referendum majority make the decision of the referendum mandatory. So mandatory is the right word, obligatory, yes. it should be, okay, so mandatory. And there is no limit. So the people who are not participating in the referendum, it means they accept the solution which will be chosen by the majority. In Poland, we have progi. How can threshold? Fresh, threshold. So, the, in referendum, should should participate 99% of the of the population. Okay. So it's you know it's it will never will work never. So we have no such a, uh, such a tradition. And the, from the systemic point of view, uh, referendum in Poland will never never work. And now, how to, what to do? Well, but it did once uh, when you were voting to go to the European Union, I think. Yeah, okay, so you know, it's ustawione, uh, so uh, I don't know how to say it in English. It was massive propaganda as well. Yeah, it was massive propaganda. You know, this question were not important, you know? So let's say they were very important. It was once for 50 years, yes? Should we participate in the European Union? But uh, they discuss the more essential questions, okay? We discuss, you know, it's an abstract thing. Do you want to be a member of European Union? Yes, I want to be a member of the European Union, but I don't want that the drunk guy is uh, representing the head of this union. So the system, yeah, yeah, I would like to live with, with Germans, with France, uh, Portuguese uh, together, okay? To, have, to share the same values, uh, but I accept the principle of subsidiarity. You, Portuguese, you can have your own constitution, you can run your own country, your community as you want, because the community is the basic, okay? Even in Switzerland, they have their own community uh, constitutions, yeah? This is the problem. Three pillars, okay? Well, if, if you are... Uh, uh, three pillars, where are they, okay? 
uh, you can be nationalist, you can be, you know, patriot, nationalist, or, you know, you have, uh, you have, have different, uh, or, you know, political or orientation. But you, if you accept this, that subsidiarity works, so I mean, we resolve our problem among ourselves. Uh, in Poland, uh, there was a case, the guy was living in, uh, around the city, and this city has a hole. So he decided to repair this hole, okay? He put some money and uh, invited some workers, and they fixed the problem with a hole in his streets. And he paid the fine, because he wasn't authorized to fix the hole on his own street, because it was a matter of the government. It's crazy, completely crazy. So it's uh, completely reversed. So if you accept that uh, the problem of your building belongs to you and you have to resolve them, this is the principle of subsidiarity. Uh, the problem of your community, of you, where do you live? Okay, it's your problem. You will resolve it. It's a principle of subsidiarity. Let's spread this idea. You know, when I ask first, do you know what does it mean subsidiarity? No one know. No one knew, pardon, no, no one knew, okay? So we have to spread it. And we have to emphasize that it's an ultimate help. It's not the obligatory help, socialist help. It's just when it's necessary, really necessary, so only then we help. Because if we help all the time, we will have chicks in our nests who will be adult and unproductive. Thank you. Yes? I'm under the impression or I've heard of that in Switzerland you have to, you don't just go to Switzerland and live there and become a citizen. That citizenship, in other words, the ability to participate and vote is something that has, you have to pass a test, you have to study. It's not, uh, I crossed the border and I and brought my six cousins and now we're gone. So after publishing, after publishing this book, we published a little leaflet uh, four pages uh, entitled How the Swiss Deal with Foreigners. <laughs> and it broke the server, you know. <laughs> because we asked, okay, you can download this and spread this message, okay? It was blocked. And uh, Peter, who is responsible technician, uh, he said, okay, it was completely blocked. Uh, this is true. You can, you, we accept you, provided you accept our regulations. The typical, uh, the lady uh, who wrote this book said to me, uh, you know, there is a lot of uh, Polish women marrying Swiss, uh, Swiss guys and they, you know, they want, want to, they, they follow Polish tradition. So the Polish tradition is some, you know, Catholic, uh, Catholic free days. And uh, she went to the school in Switzerland, she's saying, okay, uh, would, you, um, would you please me give uh, the free day for my kids because it's a Christmas and in Poland it's a free day. And uh, the director is asking, but it's not free in Switzerland. Okay, but I would like, so if you like to live in a Polish, according to Polish regulation, go back to Poland. That's all. It's, it was very, uh, you know, very precise. Okay, you don't want to follow our rules. And more, you don't become uh, Swiss immediately. You need 20 years and you need something about yes, there is a scale of, of becoming a Swiss number one, Swiss number two, and so on and so on. Right, Swiss, final Swiss. Yeah. Okay, so it, it lasts. And you have also be accepted by the community. It's not a politician who accept your, uh, accept your uh, nationality or uh, gives you this uh, Swiss nationality, but your neighbors. So it's a very good method, I think. Yes? Oh, I agree it's a very good step in a good direction, but I have to have this one comment. Um, when it comes to referendums in Switzerland, also I have been there uh, ar around the area. Uh, I know that Swiss uh, vote very good when it comes to really down to earth local problems. Then it's kind of like a household management. But if you have referendums considering more abstract things, like monetary policy, they will listen to politicians and they will not, that they will vote kind of wrong. So I still think that it is one step, but to go like full maximalist in the direction of more freedom, it takes a little, a little bit more. I think mean, we need more good education and we need people that are not indifferent also to uh, abstract things and understand 
some complex uh, economic issues, like for example monetary policy. Because if I go to University of, of Liechtenstein and I talk to a student there who's probably for them, lives there and, and studies there, he says that, well, uh, we have this uh, lecture about uh, the different types of monetary policy and then I approached the professor and I was talking about gold standard and he told me, you know what, you may be right, I may agree with you, but I cannot afford the students to think that way because then they will go work in the Hilti Corporation and the Hilti Corporation just don't want people that work for them to think that way. So even if you may be right, I will even not teach students that. And I thought, like, okay, if it is like something like that is happening in Liechtenstein, 200 meters below the castle, uh, I feel really uncomfortable now. Like this is this awkward moment in my life when I want the Liechtenstein family to nationalize the university. I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, Swiss model. I mean, I'm all the way for it, but I think we need even more. We need to educate people. We need okay, to but people. let's do the first step. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. So, uh, you know, I completely agree with, uh, with Thomas and uh, every Swiss uh, because the second, uh, second opinion was even worse. Uh, he wrote, I don't think that Switzerland is something that I can discuss outside the country since I have a very grim view. I don't think that it's a good model. I don't think that it is a good model. I don't think that it can be emulated and I don't think it is heading in a good direction. So, uh, this guy didn't come, unfortunately, <laughs> we, could, we could discuss. But I think having these three pillars, uh, political, political instruments to influence the people in power, it's a better than nothing, nothing, nothing else. Yes? Uh, the idea of subsidiarity, of course, going to the lowest uh, level of competence, of course, the lowest level is the individual, yep. which I support. But then, how do they decide, well then, it can't be accomplished by the individual, it has to be the next higher level. I think that that's decided by majority of hands going up, and that's always scary. The idea that one's individual rights are subject always to the majority of hands. I mean, I, I suspect that here in Poland, wasn't there a time when... Uh, Ken, but we have to have some regulations. We yeah. have this traffic lights mentioned by David, the, this morning, the first uh, presentation. We have to have this solution because otherwise, otherwise we will ki kill uh, all, all of us. Okay? We have to follow some rules, some principles. Yeah. And these principles should be established in talking in some kind of negotiation. Um, wasn't there a time in Poland when a majority of many communities would have said, take all the Jews and send them to ghettos? But uh, I don't think so that the Poles did it. It was a, a state regulation of German state. Um, we were uh, we were under occupation. We have nothing to say. Okay, yeah. but uh, are there times when individual rights are? How about how about drug laws? You know that uh, that you can't smoke marijuana. Okay, so if we agree in our community that we don't smoke marijuana, we should follow this principle. That's all. Because, you know, because you, uh, you cannot say that smoking marijuana is better than non-smoking marijuana. But, uh, uh, for example, the Swiss are agree that you cannot make the noise after 10 p.m. Okay, you can find that it's, it's completely stupid. But okay, they are agree on this. It's stupid for the Poles, it's, you know, because the Poles are listening to the radio the, the, the night or all night long. Okay, but I would like, if I have possibility to change the canton, I mean the country, I will move to the country when the noise is prohibited after 10 p.m. and before 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. Okay, I will. I would like to this uh, follow this rule, uh, Christoph. Uh, I'll agree with the principle of subsidiarity a lot. Uh, only you have to. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that the matter of uh, actually. Uh, practically using it of of when the when is it right to when does uh, the individual really need to uh, use the group uh, group model the group decision I think this can be resolved by uh, sound 
uh, economic theory and uh, Austrian economics are. I would say I would say there is a very good uh, 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 systemic mechanism in in the Swiss model. If one canton choose as a political system, and they write in their constitutions that every member of this canton receives from this canton 100 Swiss francs per hour, let them do this, let them do. The rest of the cantons will see how fast they collapse economically, okay? So it will be some meaning of teaching people, okay? You, uh, and I don't, uh, you know, I don't think that the Swiss, uh, at the very beginning, at the very beginning of this book is written that the Swiss didn't accept the minimum wage. Not the minimum, uh, how do you name this? Basic. Uh, basic, uh, basic income. Basic income, yeah, so this for free. They didn't accept it. And the, the lady is writing, 90% of French will accept it, okay? I think 90% of Poles as well. Maybe not 90, maybe 85. Yes? How are you going to make Poland uh, follow these rules? Uh, <laughs> so I will become dictator. <laughs> as soon as I am dictator, I am introducing subsidiarity. Because I am the dictator in my own company. And I saw the di dictator, 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 <laughs> dictatorship doesn't work. Okay, so from the very beginning, I gave a, a, a lot of freedom to my uh, employees. Uh, imagine that 90% of these people overused this uh, trust, that I trusted them and they deceived me. But, however, there were some people who uh, uh, managed to, to, to be good managers, you know, after this, after having responsibility, after uh, running their own economies and, and seeing the flow of, of currency they earn and how many of this earning is coming to their own pocket and how many earnings should be reinvested. Okay? So I think it's a very good model and I am, uh, you know, I, I found it by myself in my own company. So let me be a dictator first. <laughs> yes? Um, if you were a dictator then, <laughs> and you could um, produce the ideal state, would you have subsidiarity just at the canton level, or would you get even lower and lower? I mean, how low? L uh, subsidiarity principles says as low as possible. As, yes. As low as possible. So a collection of yeah. owners. Yeah, yeah. They want their, yeah. To have if you want, so if, if, but I think that the, this principle should say that community should decide the regulation about smoking or no, no smoking marijuana. Okay, so you can choose your own community if you want. Yeah, I think um, the way to promote subsidiarity is with concrete examples. Um, that uh, that is very very obvious. The benefits of marijuana, I think, is a great example that people could probably most likely could um, agree on that it, that look different different communities could uh, you could uh, make different laws america has retaken um, subsidiarity, subsidiarity principle on the on the initiatives on the mere marijuana issue and i hope that will make that will make other issues also being decided uh, uh, on, on the on the state level I think that that's an a example that, that was spread. The first step we should make as libertarians, if of course we accept the principle of subsidiarity, okay, because you, you might not accept it, but I think we should accept it. It's a basis of libertarianism. We should promote the concept itself, underlying that it is a help as a last resort. As a last resort. This is important because they change the meaning of this concept, you know. You can you can see it in uh, Wikipedia. So this is the first step. We can take one more question. Okay, there is no. Oh, uh, this goes back to the first question you were asked. A young woman stood up and said, "I do not like that only ten percent of people vote in a referendum." And I was only partly satisfied with your answer that well, in Poland, ninety-nine percent of people have to vote for it to be valid. When she said the 10 percent, it reminded my home city of San Antonio, where approximately 10 percent of people usually elect the mayors, and the mayors vary from 
mediocre to terrible. <laughs> in my opinion, in my view, I don't tell you okay, that, but I don't know many people. It's in very Antonio libertarian. If it's very libertarian, if you don't vote and the rest of your uh, compatriots elect the, the bastard, it's your fault, not mine. No. Okay, you deserve you deserve <laughs> such a, you deserve such a politician. You deserve such a ruler. Libertarians in America have trouble with that. I I've had people tell me, no, I don't vote. It's immoral. Uh, but um, is is there? We go back to Dr. Schmidt about the. And, and the generalization, is there a level between 10 and 99% where we ought to consider it valid participation? Okay, so these are the questions, uh, these are details, okay? The principle is we, the Poles, have no any kind of, of uh, influence on our politicians. What is seen now, uh, the, uh, the present politicians have the majority in our parliament. They pass the law, you know, it's incredible. Remember that Hitler did the same in Germany. He was uh, he, he got the power in a legal way, and later he transformed this country into fascism. And you know, uh, I, I have no words to explain uh, in what he transformed Germany, but he did it in a legal way. So this this way is not good, not not correct. We as a society should have some feedback. So, zawór bezpieczeństwa. In the technique, technique, safety vowel, safety vowel, yeah, safety vowel, yeah, vowel, 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 safety vowel, yeah. We have to have it. Thank you very much.